welcome to the latest uh, EHNRB Australia web, uh, webinar, this time on partial discharge. So on today's topics, we're, we're going to be talking and covering some of the, the most common um, questions that we've been getting and, and people have, uh, have emailed in so for us to cover. So I'm Neil Davis, this is Fred Monaghan, and we shall begin. Okay, so the contents today, what we're, we're going to, we, we'll, we'll briefly cover the, the PD classification and detection techniques. That's only going to take us a minute or two. So this is, uh, so, so we're all talking the, the same language. And then the main questions that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about dealing with background, background noise and how we, how we do with that on the different techniques. We're going to talk about the phase lock and PRPD, the importance of that so um, in, in diagnosis and, and also dealing with background, uh, the interpretation, when will it fail, and some questions on the economic justification. We've also got a section there, open forum questions. Now, in the, the webinar, in the um, software, you will have a, a questions um, box where you can submit your question. Uh, please do that at any time through the... Uh, through the webinar, we'll, we will have a formal section at the end where we can do, deal with these questions, but also if there's some questions on the techniques and the, the topics that we're talking about, just shoot them off at any time and we'll deal with them in the most, uh, um, at the most appropriate time. Okay, so without further ado, we shall crack on. So there are, there are three um, or four main Particular types of discharge that we, we deal with. So you can um, look at corona discharge, which is from a sharp point into air. You have surface discharge, cracking across the surface of uh, insulation. We have an internal void discharge, cavity discharge. Uh, we have a discharge across a gap, which has got characteristics similar to both internal cavity discharge and surface discharge. If we just closed up the two gaps, then, then that would become a cavity. So floating metal work or contact type discharge, gap discharges, is, is a thing that we come across quite often. And then, of course, we've got cable um, or discharge that happens in cables down the, down the cable itself or in joints down the cable uh, network. Now, the techniques that we deploy, that we talked about in previous webinars, Ultrasonic techniques are very much applicable to finding corona discharge and surface discharge, and they will find contact gap type di discharges provided there's an air gap, uh, air gap between the, uh, the item on the test and the, the microphone. Internal cavity discharges are not detected ultrasonically. They're only detected using electromagnetic techniques, so primarily the transient earth voltage, TEV technique, or a UHF type uh, technique. When we are looking for discharges down the cables, then we typically deploy um, a radio frequency current transformer or high frequency current transformer to look uh, from the earth on the, the cable earth at the switch gear or, or at the, um, the cable earth at the joint or the switch gear and look down the cable network. Now, there are also the instances where gap discharges will be detected by TEV. That is very common. So any floating metal with discharge, TEV will also detect that as long as well as ultrasonic. TEV will also detect very high levels of surface discharge or surface discharge which is flashing or tracking towards earth in particular. So TEV will also detect those. And if, uh, if the corona discharge again is very high, then TEV can also detect at the same time, the TEV technique will also detect stuff that's happening down the cables as long as it's not too far away. So uh, we used to typically say about 50, 100 meters down the cable if you've got a strong discharge. It can be more than that. We found discharges a couple of hundred meters or so down the cable. So if you've got a very high um, discharge in joints, not too far away from the switch gear, the signals will travel up the cable to where you're testing on the switch gear and you can detect that using TEV as well. So the TEV technique has got the potential for detecting all of uh, the different types, but is primarily deployed for detecting um, cavity type discharge. Okay. 
So let's get on to the, the questions that, uh, that we get asked and people have been asking for, for this particular webinar. Um, and the first one is, how does outside or background noise impact on PD testing? So we'll talk about background noise and the different types of technology. So first of all, ultrasonic measurement. We have to say that the going into a substation and testing for surface discharge using the ultrasonic, so what we're doing here with the, uh, the microphone testing at the air gaps on the switch gear, it's pretty rare that you are going to get high levels of ultrasonic noise in the environment that is going to stop you uh, carrying out measurements. It can happen, but it's a very rare occurrence. 40 kilohertz signals are, are very directional and they're not going to travel around corners, so they can be blocked. So as we're testing on this switch gear here, if we had some uh, ultrasonic noise being generated maybe by a, um, a light fitting uh, above in, in the, the roof there, then you can block that off just by maybe placing um, a clipboard or something or shielding that microphone from the direction of that ultrasonic source. It's very, very directional. So when we're testing on this switch gear here, pointing the microphone in this direction in towards the switch gear will detect surface discharge if there's anything happening. And then as soon as you turn it away, you stop hearing that. So the same happens with the noise. So realistically, background interference in the ultrasonic is, is a pretty rare occurrence that we don't, uh, it doesn't stop us very often from carrying out a, a proper survey. It's also very much a uh, based on sound characteristics. So if you're getting ultrasonic noise that's maybe coming from some electronics, from a battery charger or um, some electronic uh, control panels, then that will be a very much different sort of sound characteristic. It doesn't sound like PD. So you can, even if you had that in, in your um, headphones, while you're listening to it, you can still find the crackle underneath it, the crackling sound of, of a partial discharge. Nowadays, we're also looking at phase resolved plots, which Brad will talk about later. And the uh, on the instrument that we're using in this particular picture, we can get, uh, there's an algorithm which is looking for determining the difference between background noise or noise sources and partial discharge sources. So background interference in ultrasonic is not a particular issue generally. When it comes to the electromagnetic techniques, then in general, the, there are different sources that can come in, imp uh, impinge on the, uh, on, on the measurements and can cause um, interference. Now, the electrical uh, signals from these sources can come in via the power network on the Earth system. Uh, it, it can be sources that are coming in via the power network from genuine discharge sources that are associated with different plant that you're not testing at that time. They will come in along the metalwork or they can come in through the air. The electromagnetic pulses will travel across metalwork and travel through the air. Now, <clears throat> if you get broad broadband type interference sources, which may be coming from uh, poor light fittings, from motors, some electronics, VSDs, for example, Pantographs, if you're uh, near a uh, railway, then broadband in interference sources are generally limited to just a small few tens of meters. So you can often deal with them in, in basis of amplitude and time of flight measurement, which I'll talk about shortly. If you've got radio transmitters in the vicinity, then they uh, radiate at a much higher um, uh, level of power than partial discharge will, but they will be on a very narrow bandwidth. So the power is restricted to a narrow bandwidth and you can use that for um, getting rid of that interference source. So let's look at those um, in a bit more detail. So first of all, we have to say that if we look at the, the TEV instrument is, or the TEV technique is, is a wideband uh, detection, generally operating around three to 80 megahertz. Because of that, the TEV instrument is relatively insensitive on a per unit bandwidth to, um, to these narrow uh, bandwidth transmission, source, uh, transmission noises. So unless the transmitters, the radial transmitters are very close, TEV is generally not affected particularly um, by those uh, at all. It's more affected by the, 
the, the wide broadband, which, as we said previously, will tend to attenuate very much um, quicker. So you can, you can, or it won't affect it that often. So when we look at our database of um, of TEV readings, and we set the threshold for seriousness of, of TEV at 29 dB being equivalent to the top 10% of all readings that we measure on, on Twitgear, and 20 dB, the top 25%. We're not particularly interested in the TEV readings that are down at the less than 20 dB mark, or we're not very concerned with that. We start to get concerned about the TEV readings which are in these higher amber zones and particularly in the high red zones. And then when you do an analysis of the uh, the database and you look at what are the, the general amplitudes of background interference, you find that there's only approximately 5% of the background interference readings are actually getting into the amber zone at all, and less than 1% is getting into this red zone, the 29, 30 dB and above. And often you will find that some of those amber ones are actually caused by discharge in the first place. So it's not as um, often as, as all that that you will you will be coming across a situation where you've got lots of electromagnetic ma electromagnetic interference whilst you're taking the TEV measurement. <coughs> But even if you do get that, you can start looking at uh, where, what might, where, whether it will be coming from outside or whether, it, whether it's actually signals measured on, on background network, which are associated with discharge in the first place. <coughs> so in the first situation at the top here, we have a switchboard, which is generating 30 decibel source of partial discharge. And that signal, electromagnetic pulse, will travel through the air and as it travels through the air, it will flatten down and it will attenuate. And you can see we may see about 20 dB on associated metalwork, so a 10 dB or so drop. And then if we go outside of that, we may see another 10 dB or more drop. So we can see that there is a pattern that's showing a localized tie around the switchboard. And therefore, this, this external noise or what we would often call background is associated, is actually generated by the PD. And conversely, the same happens on the, the other um, situation where we've got a broadband interference source, maybe about 30 dB on from outside plant. By the time it reaches the switchboard, you should see that drop down. So that's one of the reasons why whenever you take TEV measurements, you take a background reading on metalwork unearthed, not associated with the switchgear you're testing, to see the difference. So you can see whether there's a localized high and whether there is a difference in activity. So that helps determine the source uh, or whether it is genuine interference or a partial discharge source. We also deploy time of flight measurements so we can see where the pulse is arriving first to help us with this um, analysis. When it comes to UHF, uh, then what we're utilizing is the fact that those transmission sources are narrow band. So you can see in the two uh, frequency sweeps we have that we're taking with the uh, directional antenna here, we have a frequency sweep from 50 to 50 megahertz to uh, a gigahertz. And you can see the interference sources at the top end of this are narrow. So around the um, 900 uh, megahertz sort of range or 750 megahertz range, these would be broadband, uh, narrow band transmitted uh, frequencies such as um, your mobile phone operators. The frequency sweep at the bottom, you can see, is from partial discharge. You can see how wideband that, that is. So what we do with the UHF signals is we tune away from these narrow band sources that allows us to detect the, um, the partial discharge on the basis that PD will be a broadband source. So just tuning away is a, is a simple way of getting rid of that background interference when you're uh, working in switch charge using that UHF type of transmission. And the, the final technique we use would be on um, the HFCT measurements, and that is to apply filters. So in this particular case, we've got a HFCT on a cable earth of this three-core um, filter cable. 
and the top graph is showing the um, the plots using an unfiltered. So it's capturing all uh, all of the frequencies uh, from from that particular measurement. And the bottom graph shows us when we've deployed a 1.8 megahertz high pass filter. So we've taken out that low frequency interference noise, and now we've got a clear indication that we've actually got two sources of partial discharge associated with that cable or the termination, uh, depending where it's specifically coming from, on two different phases of discharging because we've got that clustering. So using the filters, again, will remove some of that interference or background activity that we're seeing on the, um, on the electrical system. So in general, when we're dealing with background, it's actually going to probably affect you less than you will imagine. People do get a bit worked up about it. They start thinking that we've got to deal really heavily with, with background noise. That's not generally the case, actually. Where you have got sources of interference, then where possible, try and eliminate or isolate. If, if there's a local battery charger or some um, uh, defective fluorescent lighting, for example, just let's see if we can turn that off for the period of time that we're doing the test. If it's a battery charger, try and remember to turn it on before you leave. Uh, <laughs> um, look for the localized high reading. So you can always see localized high reading. So if it's genuine PD, it will attenuate away from the source. So you can still find stuff within the background reading. Uh, use time of flight, which we do in, in the monitoring to, to sort of screen out um, external noise. Tune away using the, uh, when using the UHF, tune away from the transmission frequencies and use those filters on, on HFCTs. And the final thing we do is we use pattern recognition and the algorithms on the instrument, whether it's on, on all of those different techniques, UHF, um, TV, uh, ultrasonic or HFCT, all now can use pattern recognition algorithms to determine whether it is PD or not. And with that, I'll pass over to Brad, who will deal with the next set of questions. All right. Um, there's only been one question come through. If anyone has any questions, shoot them through. So the next question we have is, is phase locking a must-have for PD testing? And the answer is, it depends. So when you've found real PD, you need to be able to see it, or the, the ideal way to determine what it is, is if you can look at the phase resolved partial discharge pattern. And that these are these diagrams that Neil's been showing you. Um, and if you can diagnose it from there, that is the best chance of figuring out exactly what's going on. Now, when we take a recording with the Ultra Tech Plus 2 instrument, we take a 10 second recording over time. And if the frequency of the instrument isn't locked on to the, the 50 or 60 uh, hertz frequency of your network at the time, um, those those events, all these all these dots that you can see on the screen here are PD events or noise events. They're just what the instrument is capturing and, pl and plotting on the screen. So if that is moving over time, over that 10 seconds, you will end up seeing things that look like noise that could be actual real PD, and that's what you're trying to find. So these two phase plots you can see here on the right-hand side are TEV measurements taken from the rear of a... Um, a pitch field cable box. And what we can see on the bottom here is real PD. So this is real single phase internal void type discharge occurring inside that cable box or very close to the cable box where the measurement was taken. And this one and the bottom one here is a properly phase locked uh, recording where it was locked onto the 50 hertz at the time. Now the top one here is the same recording taken a minute earlier where we didn't have a good phase lock and all of the data drifted over time. So when you go back to the office and you, you analyze this data on your computer, you'll look at the top one and go, oh, that just looks like noise to me because I can't see any reference to the, I can't see any patterns referenced to the 50 hertz network. So it'll be misdiagnosed. Whereas if you are analyzing this one, you can look at it straight away and go, yes, that's real PD and I, I know what I'm looking at here. So that's why it's important to get a phase lock. Um, we just yeah, lots sorry, of us. Sorry. just got a question come through. Okay, so having a good phase lock will give you the ability to better determine between PD and noise, and that's what it's all about. And then you'll be able to classify it from there, 
and it also enables multiple sources to be detected. So in this in this um, occasion here, we've just got a single phase internal void top here, but you can actually see when it's two phase, you can see when it's three phase, and you can see when there's different types of PD occurring, and that's that's what all the pattern recognition is about. So that your pattern recognition techniques won't work if you don't have good phase plots to look at, and that's what it's all about. Now, to get a good phase lock, there's three ways that the instrument does it. The first way is it will it will it's got a little photo diode in the, or photo sensitive um, sensor up the top here, and what it will look at is the the lights in the room. If they're the right type of lights, it won't lock onto LEDs because that's running at something other than 50 hertz. But it will lock onto the 50 hertz of the lights, and it will record data as your network um, is. If it's changing its frequency over time, over that 10 second recording, it will change with it. Now, if you can't get a good phase lock because there's no lights in the room or you can't bring a light source to your Ultra T plus two while you're recording, the second way to do it is to uh, look at the electromagnetic field that's in the air. So there's a setting in here that you can change and there's a little sensor on the inside the instrument that will look for the 50 Hertz or the 60 Hertz that's in the air and it will lock onto that and record. Um, according to that. The third way that it can do it, if you don't have a, um, if either of those two won't work, is you can do it manually and you can manually speed up or slow down the uh, 50 or 60 hertz uh, setting inside the instrument until your phase plot becomes nice and still on the screen and then you hit record and then you will end up with a nice phase plot that you can analyse later on. So we've got some examples of that. So TEV, these are four examples of TEV phase plots that we've recorded. This top one here on the left hand side shows multiple phase, uh, multiple defects on three phases. So the, the first defect we can see is um, probably a, a 30 to 40 decibel source up the top here. That one there, or that, that cluster of events and that cluster of events, they're 180 degrees apart and that is a, uh, you know, a high level of discharge occurring there. But what we can also see down here is we can see another pattern here that lines up with this pattern here, but that'll be on the next phase along. So just pretend that this is your red phase, this one might be your white phase, and then you've also got another pattern here and here, and that might be your blue phase. So having a good phase lock helps you analyze that data. On the top right hand corner here, we just have noise. These are just random dots along the 50 hertz or 60 hertz time wave where nothing is referenced to the 50 hertz network. It's not getting, that activity there is not being created by, um, by something that's running at 50 or 60 hertz. Here we have uh, some phase lock noise where we've got uh, six, um, basically six pulses per cycle and that's occurring over and over and over. That's noise. Uh, and then here, down on the right hand side, we have PD occurring inside oil. This one here was captured from inside a, a transformer tank where there was uh, discharge occurring inside there. And they backed that one up with an oil test to confirm. But um, as you can see, these are all well phase locked and they are ana they're easy to analyze because of that. Now it's the same with ultrasonic. When we take ultrasonic measurements, as uh, Neil was talking about earlier, we can get a good phase lock with the ultrasonic. Now, when we when we lock on with the ultrasonic, we're able to tell if there's single phases, multiple phases uh, being involved. We can tell if there's corona occurring, if it's surface occurring, and a phase lock is great for that. Now, sources of noise, if you ever take a recording and it looks like this, that there can be caused by um, magnetic type activity. So if you're listening to a transformer or a PT, a typical phase plot that comes out of uh, that type of asset will look like this. But if you test an asset and the activity that's coming out looks like this, it's you know very likely that you're picking up single phase um, surface activity there. Here's a few more examples of ultrasonic sound files. This here is what a noisy light bulb looks like. So if you have a fluorescent light bulb at the back of your switchboard or, or at the top of your switch room, and it um, is giving you something like that, that is caused by a light bulb. Here we just have random noise along the 50 hertz sine wave. Nothing is 
nothing is referenced to the 50 hertz sine wave there, so it's just random noise. Here, this one here is diagnosed as phase to phase PD because uh, we've got a longer high amplitude time running across there. If it was single phase PD, it would just be coming up and going down um, you know, quite quickly rather than staying active for longer. And on the right hand side here, we have corona. Corona is typically active only on one half of the thymus. Okay, so that's why getting a, getting a good phase lock is handy out the field. If you're just picking up general noise or very, very low level activity where um, it's not uh, worth hunting for that phase lock, uh, it's not as applicable. But when you want to get to the, when you're integrating the real stuff, it's definitely worth it. So the next question, when will it fail? That's the million dollar question. How to grade the severity of PD when you find it? So we'll start with ultrasonic activity. So ultrasonic activity, as Neil said earlier, it's caused by surface PD, corona PD, or sparks jumping the gap. It's the sound caused by sparks that we're picking up. Now there's factors that relate to the amplitude. So let's talk about the amplitude of surface activity. So when we have a, just say you go up and test a switchboard and you find something that's five decibels of sound. That means that at that time, where you're testing using that sensor with that humidity level, you've got five decibels of sound. You might go back a couple of days later and the humidity has risen and the, so the conditions have changed a bit and you might have 10 decibels of sound, so your amplitude has risen. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's closer to failure. What it means is at that point in time, it's just discharging at a louder, louder amplitude and um, you know, it's potentially more degradation is happening at the time, but it doesn't mean that. And also when it's when it's at zero decibels or when it's gone away, it doesn't mean that the defect has fixed itself. It just means that it's not active at the time of test. So on the right hand side here, we have some offline PD tests taken of a surface tracking issue. Now the one on the left here, we have a picocorn level of 34 picocorn. And then 20 minutes later, when the humidity was higher, we have a reading that's 75 times higher than the first one, up at 250 picocorn. And all that changed in that situation was the humidity within the room. Now that doesn't mean that it's far worse. It doesn't mean that it's de de degraded a whole lot, uh, a little, whole lot uh, further degradation. It just means it's discharging louder at that time. Now the, the signals will attenuate as the sound travels through different chambers and gaps in the metalwork. So if you go up and take a test at the front of a switchboard and you hear a sound, you've got to think about where's that sound coming from? Is it coming from within the chamber that I'm listening to? Most of the time it is, but it could be coming from the chamber that's behind that one. And the sound, if the sound's coming from that chamber through to your chamber and then through to your microphone, it could be that you're just hearing it at quite a low amplitude and it's really, really loud at the back. So it is a, uh, amplitude's a, interesting one to, to work with. So different barriers will block the transfer of those ultrasonic sound waves. So that's different barriers within your switchboard. And the volume of the air path between your microphone and the source of PD is another thing that will, um, another factor that will affect your amplitude. Now, how factors unrelated to deterioration affect the reading. So this was research, uh, what we have here on the right hand side is research that was conducted a few years ago by Air Technology. Where they, they, they put a, a long term high pot test on an 11 kV circuit breaker and took it through to failure while they were monitoring for PD. Now there was a extensive surface tracking that you can see here on the right hand side um, occurring at the asset. But what they found was that the amplitude of the ultrasonic sound didn't get worse and worse and worse. It didn't track up and up and up and up over time until the asset failed. They found that when the humidity was higher, the ultrasonic levels were higher, but not as you got closer to the actual failure itself. So trending the amplitude wasn't valid. Here is another example of a monitor that was uh, hooked onto an asset where it's it uh, caused, for some reason, 
whatever reason that may be, PD occurred at the asset. An ultrasonic sensor was able to hear it. And then over the space of about six weeks, the amplitudes come, come from uh, basically having no PD at all down in the background noise. The amplitude's risen from around about zero up to around about 40 decibels. And then it stayed there for the next four or five months until here is where it actually failed. So what we, there's, there's two things to take from this. The first one is that there was no PD down here at all. And then there was a certain rise time for the amplitude to get to a point where there was surface tracking occurring. And then that amplitude did not get worse until it actually failed. So um, that's another one to, to think about. Now, when we interpret ultrasonic measurements, as we, as, we said, as we've said, the absolute number, the amplitude and trending of that number is not the primary consideration. Your primary consideration is, are we detecting PD and where is it occurring? So what we do is we, 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 we record the amplitude and we record the, the phase plots. We look at the algorithms within the instrument and the interpretation to figure out, is it PD or not? And then once we've said yes, it is, the best thing you can do is take a shutdown on that asset, visually examine where the PD is occurring and, and figure out from there how long you've got before failure. Now, when we talk about TEP, what do the numbers mean? So we've got a cumulative probability curve that Neil showed earlier where 75% our, our of our readings are going to be below 20 decibels. Then the next 15% uh, are in 20 to 28, and then the top 10% uh, of readings are going to be from 29 to 60 decibels. So that's how we can grade these numbers. And we know that when internal void discharge, when, when internal void sites are active, um, the more decibel, uh, the higher the energy in the spark, the higher the decibel level you have. So we can trend the number when you're looking at TEB sources. We, we analyze the, uh, we look at the decibel levels, we look at the pulse per cycle counts. We also look at the phase plots and we look at the waveforms of those PD pulses to figure out where that's going. Now, when we have sparks jumping gaps, if that gap keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the sparks will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Your decibel level will become bigger or higher and higher and higher. And you can trend that over time. So it's useful to trend TEB amplitudes. Um, so you, you look at the phase plot. The highest TEV signals are not always where the source of the activity is. So if you go up and take a TEV reading on the back of a cable box and you find that you've got you know, 30 decibels there, you've got to figure out where that's coming from. So it could be imported from a joint nearby that's discharging, it could be from a termination, it could be from a switch gear. So that's how we interpret those TEV uh, signals. You've got to do further testing and and have a look around, hunt around. Now, when you're looking at TEV problems, a visual examination of the asset may not always help because um, the, the, uh, the sites of the discharge are internal to the asset. So it may not look any different from the outside, but your failure history and consideration of the failure history, the failure history of that asset and um, engineering judgment plays a big role in the interpretation of that. Here we have a case study of a ring main unit. So this is a 22 kV ring main unit. This is one that Neil and I worked on where back in August 2017, we found TEB signals, 38 decibels, one and a half pulses per cycle. That's up in your high range. It's above 30, so it's in the red range. Uh, located at a ring main unit. Then we, we came back uh, August three months later and we tested it again. The amplitude level is higher. That's up at 50 decibels now. And then four months after that, this, this asset actually failed. There was a um, high voltage failure behind the bushings in the, in the high voltage switch of that asset. So in this instance, we were able to trend it higher. Well, it got worse towards failure. Now, interpretation of cable PD using the high frequency current transformers. So what we're doing when we're using the HFCTs, again, we're looking at the phase plots and also we look at the waveform. When we look at the phase plots, we're looking for clusters of activity 180 degrees apart. We generally have them opposite polarity to each other. So in this instance, we've got a negative polarity on the first half of the sine wave and then a positive on the second half of the 
on them. But pattern recognition says that's a single phase internal voice for this. Uh, when we look at the waveforms, generally have a unipolar pulse, and a unipolar pulse means that it'll be it'll shoot up or it'll shoot down, and then continue on from there. And our amplitudes. Again, we look at the amplitudes of the cable PD readings to so that we can classify them. Now, we have higher allowable levels or, or higher red, amber, green levels of for paper cables than we do for, for XL forty cables. And that's because paper cables can take more discharge than plastic cables can. So, and we also have different allowable levels of or recommended levels from within the cable itself, so the bulk of the cable, as opposed to its accessories. So if you have discharge in a joint, it can generally take more discharge than it can in a cable based on experience. And that's because you can have you know, sharp points in joints or discharge across gaps in joints and that type of thing. So there are uh, databases of, of readings for allowable levels in those instances. Here we have a case study. A 6.6 .6 kV cable at a, a high voltage customer here in Australia where PD was located to an XLPE to paper lead transition joint. Um, the level of picocoulombs was around 4,000 picocoulombs. Now 4,000 picocoulombs for paper is, is not too bad, but for XLPE it is, it is in the high level. Um, so, but when you've got mixed cables where you've got paper and plastic, you have to make a judgment call as to the distance down the cable of where the, uh, the discharge site is most likely to happen. So this one was tested. We, at, we had the phase plots to analyze the waveforms to analyze. We were able to get a distance to PD pulses, which lined up exactly with where a joint was at, at, the, uh, at the plant. And then four years after we tested that and analyzed it, the uh, joint failed at the location that we said it was going to. So, um, but that was a you know moving towards high, depending on what uh, on what um, scale you're putting it in the XLP that it took, and it failed. So. But when will it fail? When will it fail again? It's a million dollar question. <laughs> So predicting time to failure. Predicting time to failure is a difficult thing, but knowledge is your best friend in terms of how much do you understand about where the discharge site is, what sort of insulation is the discharge site at, and how far do you have before a phase to earth or a phase to fail stop across your insulation, so the physical distance. Um, so picket columns. Picket columns is, is, is just another measurement of a unit. It's not a predictor of severity of failure. Um, but picket columns is used the same way that decibels is used, where the higher the decibels, the higher the picket columns is the higher the amplitude. But you still need to understand more about your discharge site to make these judgment calls. Okay, so the one on the left here, this is a an internal void PD issue built inside a a cast resin CT. This cast resin CT here has been has been chopped in half, but you can see here there's this, this black mark where there was a, an internal void issue. That was tested offline and they found 100,000 picocoulombs um, of energy, of, of, of discharge, occurring at that site. So that's a very high level of picocoulombs. But because of the physical construction of this CT, how hard the insulation is uh, and where it physically is, where the physical discharge site is, We've probably got years and years and years before this one's going to fail. Now the one on the right hand side here, that was te tested offline and we had a, a relatively low level of picket columns where we've got three, uh, 30 to 300 picket columns, which is far lower than 100,000. But how long does that one have before failure? And it's probably got a couple of months before failure because we can see this surface tracking occurring, these carbonised tracks. Um, eating their way through that insulation. They're trying to way, make their way from the HV side over to the earth side. Once these two tracks meet each other, that will start to conduct and it will fail. So factors to consider is the type of discharge, internal surface or corona. Where is the discharge occurring? Is it in, as an example, is it in porcelain or is it in polymer? Is it in paper or is it in XLPE? Uh, the position of the discharge site, how close is it to a phase or to another to earth, to a phase or earth. Uh, the amplitude, so the amplitude is, is very relevant for cable PD and for PEV. 
not so relevant with ultrasonic, um, but all the trending of it is not so relevant. Uh, the, higher the higher the amplitude that we have, the more energy that's available. Uh, the pulse per cycle count, is it intermittent, continuous, all those types of things go in towards making an engineering judgment on, on the, you know, the, the discharge site that you're tracking. Okay, so any questions on that? Shoot them through and I'll take them answer. One more question to your answer, Brad, before okay. we swap over. Thanks. So how much cheaper is it to fix before fail? Another interesting question with uh, many answers, but let's, um, let's start looking at a few of those. So let's have a look at this one here. So we've got a 33 kV uh, bus bar uh, connections here. So the bus bar connections are discharged. You can see we've, we've taken an outage. We've had a look at it. Uh, you've got verdigris, so greenness on that metalwork. You've got the white powders, the tracking marks on these bus bar connections. Now, in order to take that, um, in order to take that outage, that, that's quite an expensive thing. So we've got to have a bus bar outage on a 33 kV um, zone substation or uh, primary substation. In order to fix that, we're going to have to replace these joints and these shrouds, and we're going to have to do quite a bit of work on that. So it's quite expensive. You know, you, you, the outage alone is, is going to cause you issues, particularly um, if you've got production on the end of it. So the alternative, of course, is to let it go like that. So this particular instance, they didn't fix it and they let it fail. So now we've got another bus bar outage, but the bus bar has decided when that outage is going to be rather than us. It's probably going to be four o'clock in the morning. It's probably going to be at the most inappropriate time. You're going to have um, network issues. You're going to lose power, um, uncontrolled manner. You've probably got quite a bit more overtime going in for the staff going in there. You've now got, still got to replace all these bus bar joints, but you've got to, you've got the soot and the debris that's gone from the, the failure has gone into the other chamber. So from the bus bar chamber, maybe down to the uh, circuit breakers, it's probably traveled up the bus bar. So you've got to clean that. You've got to get that um, the carbon and the, the debris away. Otherwise you're just going to get secondary failures. So your outage time is going to be much longer it's going to be uh, unplanned, so it's going to be unplanned overtime, more generation. You're going to lose uh, network over a period of time in an unplanned manner. So all of these things will add up until this is a much higher cost. Probably at the very minimum, it, the, the cost of fixing it before, uh, before failure is going to be at least, um, it's a fraction, for, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30% maybe on this particular instance. If you're going to prevent a catastrophic failure, then of course it's going to be a lot cheaper. Um, as we come, a, I've come across some uh, quite interesting article in the TD World, which is the references there, which just shows you something that we've been saying and, and been understanding for years is that the majority of disruptive failures on transformers are actually caused by not inside the oil, but the um, the connections, the bushings, the the cable terminations on the outside tank. This particular picture here, 100 MVA transformer fire was the result of an 11 kV cable termination failure. Now, DGA isn't going to pick up that termination problem. Uh, you will if you get in there and fix it before that happens. And of course, you've got a much uh, uh, big saving. Uh, catastrophic failures, of course, are going to be much, much more costly than, than intervention. Luckily, not everything is catastrophic. Um, so that's, you can't always rely on that. When you're looking at industrial processes and the critical, very high critical plant, whether that's industrial or or, or a um, electricity network where you've got very critical plant, just preventing the failure can will it's all the the network performance issues or the uh, the network outages and the loss of supply, which is the uh, the um, the key factor here. If you knew you were always going to get this or high critical switchboard, then that's why it's very uh, worthwhile testing very frequently or putting on permanent monitoring things like this. So this particular instance here in in the, the environment, um, a fifteen million dollar failure was averted by uh, targeting PD and then activity on their shutdown, which occurred every once every four years. So a minimum fifteen dollar outage uh, um, prevented there and going in. To fix that. So, of course, if you've got very high critical, 
then that, that number becomes a very easy calculation. But if we look at that, not all failures are catastrophic and uh, you might have a very contained one. So what, we, what we're going to show here is just a case study uh, that Singapore Power did a, a, a few years ago now, or 10 years ago now, where they were increasing the performance, improving the performance of their network through the um, introduction of condition monitoring. So monitoring uh, or managing the network through condition monitoring. And, and Singapore were able to drive down their, their, their SADI, their CML, so the average um, outage very well down by, by changing some network um, configuration, but also by using condition monitoring where we go into the dark blue mode is where they've used condition monitoring to pull their SADIs down very, very high. Now, in order to do that condition monitoring, of course, you're going to have to spend money to do it. Now, the failures that they've averted or that they've analysed in this test that they averted over a period of uh, the 10-year period were across the network from 400, from the 6.6 kV right the way up to 400 kV. And this is all assets, transformers, cables, switchgear. They, they've um, assessed that they've averted 571 failures over that period. And then they've done a financial um, assessment of that. So the cost, the potential cost of the fault, uh, you can see the majority of them on their distribution type voltages on the 6.6 and 22 kV, as you would expect, uh, higher volumes and, and more probability of failure in that respect. You can see the, the potential cost of the faults was around 86, just under 86 million Singapore dollars over that period. It does cost you money to introduce condition monitoring. They assessed that or they, they calculated that to be around 25 million um, of costs of condition monitoring. And of course, you got a cost of rectification. You have to take that outage. You've got to fix things up. You've got to go in there and replace cable termination. You've got to go into that 33 kV bus bar and replace the uh, the joints uh, on that bus bar. So the cost of the rectification, about 8 million or so. If we add all of that up, and then what we've got is uh, take away the, the cost of condition monitoring, the cost of, cost of rectification from the cost potential cost of the fault, and you've got a cost avoidance calculation around 50 or so million. So... In this particular, that's quite a widespread study that su would suggest that the um, you get around 60% savings from introducing from condition monitoring when you've got a large network. So very high critical, then the, the cost benefit analysis is very much um, a quick and easy. And when you're going into, into the high volume network, then it all becomes this sort of calculation and you're seeing around that. We've done calculations in cable networks and even on a cable, which is probably the hardest one. If you're going to proactively go after a cable fault, you might have to dig up the road, replace a joint, um, put two new joints in a section of cable. The, the analysis that we're seeing that on a electricity industry now is even um, proactively going out of that is saving at least around a, a, a third of the cost of the fault. So the fact that you haven't got emergency work to be done, you haven't got um, the overtime, you haven't got the generation, uh, additional generation, so you're changing the network configuration. So doing things in a planned manner versus an unplanned manner, even if you've still got to dig up the road, you've still got to change the, uh, take out the faulted joint and replace two new joints, is even that is saving you um, a third of the cost. So... The economic justification is, um, it can be done in all different ways, but is, is generally shown that condition monitoring is very much um, a, an economic benefit. So that brings us to the end of the um, questions in advance. Uh, we've got our, uh, we've got plenty of questions that Brad is, uh, is furiously typing away in, in now. <laughs> and if we, if we want to take any of them, we can do so if you've got any questions that you wish us to scroll through um fire them through now i just got a question here about the um tilk and xlpe okay so when you we just got a question here when you know 
you have the length of the PILC and the XLP, but not necessarily where, uh, using time of flight and characteristic, can you determine whether the feeding is in the XL section or the PE? That's the yeah, the it's distance. just a distance fog. Um, Table data. Not not easy. Uh, that's that's not an easy one. You you can de you can through different techniques uh, determine where joints are if you're taking things offline. But online testing is difficult. Um, so that's that's not easy really. That just relies ultimately on the um, on the on the, the the cable records and what information you have. The the one thing to say about the difference between XLP and uh, and paper cables is, is when we showed that table is the the tolerance of XLP to um, to discharge is, is much much less than paper and it for that reason and the fact that you've got a very quick time period between XLP discharging and a failure occurring when we're testing XLP cables we are almost certainly only seeing discharge at the joint position so if you're seeing sort of a widespread uh, discharge away from what you think your joint positions are, then that will be in, in a PILC type cable. Uh, and the, the most likely locations for any discharge, certainly on an XLP section, will be on, on the, the joint itself. But actually determining which bit is um, XLP and PILC without knowing that is, um, is one trick too far for a new player. Okay. Um. So I've answered all the questions, but we could go through them quickly here. Okay, you ready? Could just we could just finish. Um, we've got we've got uh, so oh, one of the questions was phase lock. Phase lock effect decibels or phase lock. Oh uh, yeah, there's a phase lock effect decibels or pulse per cycle. No, not um, in not in any uh, major way. So before we had phase resolved um, plots on on the instruments, we just had the decibels and the pulse per cycle. And you can make an assessment of the type of discharge just with those two numbers anyway. So an internal void discharge would be relatively low pulse per cycle and quite high on the on the decibel level. And um, a surface discharge will be the, the other way around. If you get surface discharge with TEV, it'd be quite a high pulse per cycle with, with a relatively low. So you can get quite a long way without the PRPD. This is the PRPD, what the, the PRPD plot really does for you is really increase that level of certainty and help with the diagnostics. And then we had a question regarding, where is it? Do you recommend any ultrasonic sources investigated or only the high level ones? That's important. That's, yeah. a, that's a pretty common question, is it? Yeah, so do you investigate? Ideally, investigate everything. Now, if it's a very, very low source, then, then you've probably got more time. It's just very difficult for all the reasons Brad was talking about with the, um, the level of humidity in the atmosphere, the, the, the volume of the air gap between the, the sensor and the internal means means that, that 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 number can can read a whole load of different things the quicker you go in to an, an ultrasonic source or a surface tracking source the potentially the quicker and the easier the fixes so what happens with surface tracking is you will end up with uh, nitrous oxides being generated uh, combining with the moisture to produce nitric acid and then that will start attacking other insulations so you'll often go into a, a, a long-term surface discharge problem and start seeing corrosion um, and start seeing verdigris on things and you've got a bigger bigger problem to to fix you, you've got maybe more work to do so ideally the, the the foolproof way of determining whether the ultrasonic or the surface discharge inside switch gear is a significant and serious problem is unfortunately to open it up but uh, if you can open it up whilst it's in its early stages you might get a quick fix as well so, uh, yeah, I'm afraid visual examination is the, the best way when it comes to surface tracking. Mm. Um, then, uh, a lot of people are asking about how we're analysing the phase plots. Um, and, you know, it's 
account for another. That's probably for for a, a more an, another advanced um, um, session, or if you or, or, or um, more more detailed training. Um, you can see uh, the slide up there. We we do have online training courses that are going to last a, a full one day, where we can go into a bit more detail. We have more time. Um, the a lot of that is is based on experience and building up databases to show the different types. So. Uh, the the main thing that you're going to be looking for as a general rule is that you're seeing clusters of activity 180 degrees apart, which are uh, stochastic, so slightly random around the same point. So when you you saw uh, the example of where Brad was showing, the one with six vertical lines and they're very very tight clusters, that's phase lock, but but very tight as at the same point every single every single cycle. What a discharge will be due to the slight changes in the inception voltage, the fact that you've got some charge left over, so space charge left over will mean the inception voltage changes uh, as, as cycles continue, is that you get a sort of random nature around uh, the the same part of the of the phase of the cycle. So it's it's it's, stoch uh, it's a stochastic type pattern. So you see that slightly random uh, wave shape stochastic pattern around the 50 hertz cycle is the main thing to be looking for. The, then trying to interpret what that means with different types of defects um, becomes very much more aligned around um, experience, uh, databases, type of switch gear and things like that. So we are collecting different patterns and different switch gear and seeing common things appearing. So we can interpret that a little bit more. It's just a we would need to pull in a lot of other um, information. We would, we could easily do another webinar going around that and looking at that. Mm. Or you can do a train course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, um, I believe we're going to send a link. Out yeah, the link will come will come out with it in case uh, anybody who is um, is new to this or you know of anybody who is is newer to it and um, and would benefit from from going through right from the beginning to. To, to more advanced then um, that that is something that we we do do we do an online course on the uh, to allow people to join in okay yeah any other um no that's pretty much it yep we've just got one I'm not sure if that one we're gonna answer but Okay, so you got one. So it's a relatively high single phase step on a TT chamber, 11 kV switchboard sitting there for almost 10 years. No visual sign of PD, doesn't change much. Um, and you've had a monitor on it for a couple of months. What is the best course of action knowing that the switchboard will be gone in the next five to 10 years? At 35, right, that, that, that ultimately, uh, spawn from magic, uh, that ultimately depends on the type of switch gear and the failure history. So, if you had that cast resin CT and it was the, the like the Rayroll LMT one that we showed earlier, then that could quite um, that could quite easily um, last another five or ten years. What you're what you're really looking at, at that point is risk and and the, the criticality on that switchboard. So you have. You have a discharge source, which is a known discharge source, so it is a potential weakness. The ideal thing to do would be to take that that weakness off, uh, because then then you're you're bringing the system back and you're you you're basically um, reducing the probability of failure. The probability of failure still may may be quite low on the basis that it's it's been sat there and it's been consistent for a long period of time. So if you continue to monitor that and you don't see any upward trend. Then that gives you a good indication that the, the source is not evolving massively and that could give you some confidence to to continue on i would suggest monitoring in in the in the um as a minimum the but the other thing is it does depend on the failure history and the type of switch gear and things like that so it becomes that whole engineering judgment if we see 35 decibels on a particular type of switch gear where we know they fail and they don't last for a long time then we're going to put a much higher emphasis of getting that off the network than if we had 50 dBs 
on a CT where we know that there's whole populations of them in there that fail very infrequently. So it becomes the engineering judgment. You cannot, in any of this, unfortunately, just say that one number is bad. What we're giving you and what we've shown in, in the levels is that cable joint was in the amber stroke red level and it failed within four years. We had the, the switch gear, the ring main unit, was solidly in the red zone and we did two measurements and within um, eight months of the first, it had failed. Within four months of the second, it had failed. It's in the red zone. So the risk and the criticality or the, the risk and the probability of failure is much higher because it's in that red zone. You will get some discharges that stay in that red zone. That 35 dB that you've got there, Magic, will be in the red zone and that's staying a long time. So that whole engineering judgment comes in. But what we know, it's in that area there where it is, it is the higher probability of failure than if it was down in that amber or that green zone. So engineering judgment, unfortunately, is, is a way and we can't just put one number and a machine against this. Otherwise, we'd all be out of a job. Yep. No worries. Well, um, there's no more questions coming through, so uh, Maggie, just said thanks. Yep. Um, okay, you said just... that the amplitude of ultrasound PDs are not meaning the severity. How can we uh, classify the, the seriousness of ultrasound PD? And, and that's really... That goes, there is a, there's a little bit we can do when, when it comes to phase plot. So if we have an ultrasonic um, uh, PRPD plot, which is showing that it's corona, if we've got quite, a, and not a very sealed chamber, then that would, we, we can say that's not particularly serious uh, because the, um, it's, that will be going from a, a, a sharp point into a gas air typically. Uh, when it becomes, after that, it the, the the phase plot to a certain extent will help us if it's a contact type problem, which may be a metal to metal type joint that won't won't um, particularly discharge, but will cause problems over an extended period of time, or will discharge but won't track, won't cause surface tracking. Where we see that it's actually surface tracking, the only real way of gauging that seriousness is to open it on digital examination. So the the PRPD plot will help because it will determine the type of the discharge. And if the type of the discharge from PRPD is suggesting surface discharge, then the only way of really gauging seriousness is to open up and visual examine. Okay. All right, we're probably at the end of our allotted time. So thanks very much for people attending this. Um, we've put our contact details in here so if you do have any burning questions and you want to uh, link into us uh, send us an email then feel free to do that and like I say we do have these um, more advanced online training courses so if you do want to or you know of people uh, obviously not you guys because you're all really experienced and clever already but if you've got uh, any colleagues that might want it then then um, uh, <laughs> have a look at that as well and, and thanks very much for attending and we'll be um, we're, uh, we'll be doing an, uh, another webinar sh in some time couple, uh, couple, couple of months <laughs> couple of months couple of months so look out for that one and thanks very much and everybody stay safe and have a good day thanks guys see you later thank you